Hello and welcome to another episode of Belcast. Thanks to everybody who listened to last week's episode, as always, it's greatly appreciated. This week's episode is going to be another interview um, that I conducted on Friday night with Jane Morris. Jane is such an interesting person and I really, really enjoyed speaking to her. Um, Jane has a wealth of experience throughout her career, from journalism to uh, the European Commission to helping with the Good Friday Agreement, becoming a, an MLA, um, so much experience and, and some great stories to tell. So I was really pleased to speak to Jane and I appreciate her putting the time aside to, to speak with me. So um, I'll not spoil too much of the, the chat, but um, it's a bit longer than usual, but I think it will be a really um good interview and a good conversation to listen to so here we go my interview with jane morris okay so i'm here w- with jane morris um jane do you want to just tell us a bit about yourself for the listeners oh well where do i start um i've had a very very interesting challenging and rewarding career, I think is the best way to describe it. Uh, I started off life, if you like, well, I went, when I went to university here in Northern Ireland, born and bred in Belfast, uh, University of Coleraine University as it was, University of Ulster, and I chose as my subject the European Union. Interesting. And it was 1973, it was the year we joined, so okay. I've always been slightly ahead of my time. <laughs> uh, and there was only about six people in the in the class. So I studied the common market, the EEC. And uh, then I went on, and let me see, oh yes, I, I took a gap year in, in America. Oh, very nice. Uh, working as a waitress. Whereabouts? I, I've all, in New York. Oh, nice. And I've often actually said that uh, I learned more on the streets of Manhattan than I did four years at university. But don't don't tell the university <laughs> I said that. <laughs> well, you but you really become streetwise uh, there. And it's a very I think I I have often said that I think that um, if someone who's worked with people, whether it's waitressing, barman, uh, any uh, you know, any sort of work like that. It's very, very valuable interaction. So when I started employing people, I don't mind people mentioning that in their CV because I think it's quite useful. Yeah. It's a good learning. So then after New York, I went to uh, Brussels and lived there for six years and worked as a journalist uh, for a French press agency covering the third world of Africa and Southeast Asia. Very interesting. And then I came back and uh, got a job at the BBC. BBC Belfast. And that was 1986. And uh, I was a radio, then TV reporter. Um, uh, and there were uh, current affairs and news. And it was, there were some strange moments. Well, how long were you working there for? I was five years in the BBC in Belfast. And obviously the very, the, 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 the most shocking was the Enniskillen bomb. Now, I didn't go to Enniskillen that day, but we, I was involved in the reporting on the, uh, on the surrounding and the Gordon Wilson interview. I always talk about the, the watershed and the troubles, I believe that was. The father who lost his daughter in the bomb and it was on. we put his interview on air the next day and it, he forgave her killers. And there were, you know, there were journalists in the BBC newsroom crying when they heard that. And, and uh, the, they say that cars stopped in Belfast when they heard it on the news. The Gordon Wilson interview was such an, an important moment in our troubles. I'm sure it was really difficult when you were working on the BBC. Like, there was other thing. You were there for five years, so that would have been when like people like Jerry Adams were dubbed over and and things like that. You know. Uh, yes, that, w- absolutely. And in fact, that's another that's another moment. Milltown Cemetery. I don't know whether you know about it. Um, we were in the we were in the BBC newsroom, and the lunchtime news came on, and and we'd done our work. But the producer came running in and said, "They're they're sh- they're, they're killing each other up at Milltown Cemetery. Get up there!" And I had to grab my tape recorder. And lucky enough, there was another girl yep. in there at the time. She came in a car with me to head up to Milltown Cemetery up on the Falls Road to to report on what was happening. Michael Stone. Uh, yeah, it was Michael Stone, but. 
obviously there were reporters there already, but this was just to add to because what was going on. And I got to the bottom of the Falls Road and the policeman stopped me. And he said, sorry, dear, can't go up there, it's too dangerous. And I thought, phew, thank heavens. And then I realised it was a BBC reporter and I should. So I, I produced my, my press card and the policeman said to me, on you go, dear, it's your funeral. <laughs> Went up and arrived into Milltown Cemetery. Now, obviously, all the mayhem had passed by this stage, although I didn't know until I got there. And it was like, it was like a scene from a Shakespearean tragedy. It was like, I mean, I, 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 it was like three layers of, of death. You know, there was the, there were the long time dead in the cemetery. There were the people who were being buried. Yep. And then there was newly dead. And it was three layers and, and you could see the grave diggers with the, with the, with the spades over their shoulders and people hiding behind uh, gravestones. And it was a very, very strange moment to relive. And actually, on the peace walls in, in that part of Belfast, there are pictures of exactly that, with, with people hiding behind the gravestones and things like that. And that was actually the first time I ever interviewed Jerry Adams. Uh, um, and was, he, was he dubbed over? or uh, Actually, <laughs> He was interviewed, and I just had to report on what he said oh, okay. on the news that night. So that was that. So that's BBC. Eventful <laughs> uh, <laughs> already. <laughs> um, going on then. So where are we now? We're in '92. I finished, and I saw an advert in the paper. It was still at the BBC. Just my son had just been born. And it, the advert said, Head of the European Commission Office in Northern Ireland, job requirements, um, help, how many years, six years, postgraduate journalistic experience, knowledge of Europe, knowledge of Northern Ireland, and fluency in a foreign language. Ticked all the boxes. It was written for me. <laughs> it was too perfect. And uh, so I went for it and I got it. And uh, there's another, there's more lovely stories about that. You want to keep me going? Yep, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, with my journalist experience, I thought to myself, right, I'm going for this interview for this job. I need, I need to have something concrete to offer at the interview. So I phoned the president of the European Commission. As you do. As you do. <laughs> but being in the BBC, you get into the habit of just picking up the phone and trying. Yes. And, um, but I got, I got his right-hand man. And I said, look, I want, I'm going for this interview for the head of the EC office. Um, could I tell them that I, the most important thing would be to get the President, Jack Delors, to Northern Ireland? And the guy said, yes. And I said, well, would he come? He said, yes. So at the interview, I said, my aim would be to get Jack Delors to Northern Ireland. I got the job in the March of that year, and Jack Delors came to Northern Ireland in the December. Brilliant. And Jack Delors was the president of that. He was the one who set up the peace program. And it was Peace One was set up. I was I was involved in the task force setting up the peace program, and um, and that's another incredible story, because that what happened there was we had three months, and Jack Delors said, right after the ceasefires, ninety four, we phoned him and he said, right, now's the right time. Draw up a list of the needs of Northern Ireland in the new political climate and put a price tag on. We set up a task force and consultation with everyone, and in three months, in the December, the the ceasefires were announced in October. In the December, we got the list of the needs of Northern Ireland. The price tag was four hundred million pounds or euros or ecus that it was at the time. It went straight to the heads of state and government who were meeting in Germany, and they all said yes. So in three months, we got a yes to 400 million euros for a peace program for Northern Ireland. And that was the peace one, and we're now in peace four. And how did that were you involved then in saying where this money should go? Like, was it budgeted it out or? Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a very, very, that was, it was a speedy move to get the money earmarked. And then, of course, we had to get it worked out how it would, how it would be handed out. And that was a very ingenious way. It wasn't, I was in, uh, we, we used consultation for that. So grassroots community workers, trade unions, business and, and NGOs and uh, all sorts were voluntary sector. Yep. We're all advising us how it should work. And it was 
perfectly done, and in fact it's something I'm now wanting to replicate, but how they did it was it was divided into three. The first, the first third went straight to the government to hand out. The second third went to local councils, and that was pretty ingenious because local councils would only get the money if they worked together yep. from across the divide and agreed how to spend the money. So that was a third, and then another third went to what was called intermediary uh, funding bodies. So it was new groups set up at the very grassroots to distribute the money. And there was a lot of incredibly, uh, things like the trauma center, WAVE, uh, things like, you know, cross community work, uh, integrated education, I yep. think, got uh, good backing from that sort of thing. So that was the peace money, and I, I think it's worked very, very well. Two billion it has spent in Northern Ireland to date. And we can talk about the whole Europe thing after. Um, but so wh where did you go then from the European Commission? That's where it gets interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a, yes. Uh, at the, I was coming to the end of my term and I got a letter on my desk. And it said, we're thinking of setting up a political party. Would you like to come along to the first meeting? And I thought, wow, I've been discovered. Absolutely. I'd be with all my work in the in the um, on the peace program. I'd met so many superb people, and particularly women. And one that stands out is May Blood, who's been the leader of integrated education for so long now. Uh, but you know, I'd met people like her uh, walking across, across communities, the very grassroots, and you know, to 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 get involved with them and setting up a political party. I absolutely went to the first meeting, and at the first meeting there was about 70 women in a room, and somebody said, we're thinking of setting up a political part, women's political party, and everyone's hand went up, <laughs> and that was the start. But we had only six weeks, I mean, I talk about the 400 million for the peace program, we had three months to get that, uh, but we only had six weeks to stand to, for the elections to the peace talks, and, and we fielded something like... 70 women and um, many if not most of us had never been involved in politics in our lives before yeah and we were climbing lampposts and 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 putting up posters and picking our manifest our our manifesto it was it was very very good and there's people like Avila Kilmurray and obviously Monica McWilliams Pearl Sager all of those people and an awful lot more brilliant brains and um, we had for our manifesto we had three principles, inclusion, equality, and human rights. So anything we wanted to do had to tick every single one of those boxes. And that's how we worked out, you know, just those three things. Yeah. And um, everything had to be tested against that. So we did it, and, uh, and the, the, the election had been set up in such a way to elect to the talks, and the, the, it was Mo Molum was Secretary of State, another absolutely brilliant person, and I'm campaigning now to get a, a, a statue for her in Belfast. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so the, the plan was that the top ten parties would get two representatives at the tops. So we had six weeks to get into the top ten. In six weeks, we became the ninth political party in Northern Ireland and got two Monica McWilliams and Pearl Sager into brilliant. the top. So um, I was still at that stage in the Commission office, so I was only involved in the, on the fringe of the talks process, which then evolved into the negotiations for the Good Friday Agreement. Okay. And so we got into the negotiations, and um, I'll tell you the, yeah, the, st the, story the you were involvement telling on integrated education. Uh, obviously, Monica and Per were, you know, for, for many, many months, uh, in the talks constantly and there was some of us on the fringes of it helping out where we could just five days before Good Friday before the final agreement uh, there was a s small team of us looking at the final draft and myself and Anne Carr another great supporter of integrated education noticed that there was mention of education but no mention of integrated education and we were gobsmacked five days to go before the Good Friday deadline and not one